So hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, it's great to be here in Dublin. It's my first time here. Um, so a little bit of the context. Uh, we've been asked to give a small, a short speech on a conversation on how the proper role of uh, Apache Spark within a data science platform. So my name is Luis Soriano. As Sharon mentioned, the senior product manager for IBM's data science experience, which is our very own data science platform. And on the course of that, we've been working with many companies and just helping them get up to speed, help them get started with um, their data science efforts. A lot of what we encounter, though, is we actually encounter many situations where there's people, <laughs> the technical people, people in IT, people in the machine learning department or data science department, they actually know what tools they want to use, they know what they want to do. There's a big gap between that and the knowledge to the executives in terms of helping the, the executives understand what the proper role of Spark is, what Spark does versus what other tools do, and what you actually need to be effective. So we have um, a short talk today in terms of some of the findings that we have from that and how we can actually make the pitch for, for executives. So this is more of a business-oriented conversation. So to start off a little bit, just a quick intro. It's me on the left, uh, pre-beard. Um, I was the founding VP of analytics for Time Warner Cable for half the company. So it was my job to build that function up from the ground up. Uh, we had team 10, we had 9 billion in revenue, and we had <laughs> one of the most antiquated companies in the world because they're very insulated, and we had to, we had to make them data-driven. Um, before that, I was at McKinsey, so help companies really focus on help making them become data-driven from the perspective of an advisor. My counterpart, Armand, who's the lead, my counterpart on the technical side, he, his claim to fame, he is a data scientist at Vodafone. His claim to fame is that he once took down their network in Barcelona because he messed up some of the data science. So <laughs> we bring lessons, hard learned lessons from the client side. We're actually not long time IBMers. We're more people who have actually had to do this in real life experience in the real life environment and actually have a business impact via this. So at a high level, just give you a quick summary on what we see, what role we see Spark playing in data science platforms. The first role we see is Spark as a core engine foundational to a broader platform of tools. Um, it's definitely not, it's, it's necessary but not sufficient for that. The second one is, this is actually a more emerging one, is we actually see it as a pathway to parallel, parallelize uh, the serial approach of traditional uh, tools like R and Python. What you don't see on here is that you can actually, you don't see a perspective that you can actually use Spark standalone, raw, open source Spark as your full comprehensive data science platform. It's actually one of the interesting things when we talk to companies, they ask us, why can't we just download open source and use it as is? Um, they don't realize the, the huge gap between what it takes to actually make enterprise, to make uh, data science enterprise ready with all the production, uh, versioning, monitoring that goes along with it, and what open source offers. So hopefully after this talk, you'll be able to have some slides you can go back and make that case for your executives. So taking a step back, um, the first thing is that we actually really underestimate just how big a role the actual math and algorithms play within a full data science um, process. This is a, a great chart, a, a paper that was uh, done I think a year or so ago. Uh, it's really interesting, it's worth uh, looking up and reading. And you, what you see is that all the different things, all the different things around the machine learning are actually much, much bigger in scope and effort and time than the actual math and algorithms, right? So just getting the data, and frankly, that data collection should probably be the biggest thing there. Um, making sense of it through the features, verifying it, and then actually doing the machinery of it, having the resource management, the compute, having the analysis tools that connect to it people so that people can actually uh, draw insights and patterns making sure it's all governed through GitHub integration or type of versioning, and then actually deploying that thing. All that takes a long time. Um, one example from my prior experience as a VP of analytics, I wanted to put a recommendation engine into the call center. It took me two months to get the math right, and it took me six months concurrently to get the actual deployment. And that was just for a plain old Java object, one, one version of it. So if I wanted to go back and, re and kind of iterate that, that was gonna be another two, three months. So people really underestimate the effort required. And this actually starts getting us towards the path of why we need more than just that one little math and science component. So given those needs, what we're starting to see is that we're starting to see the market converge towards really common and similar architectures. 
So you see on the top part, you have clients. Your R Studios, your Jupyter Notebooks, even command lines. Um, and then you're starting to see behind that a platform to start deploying common components. And the common components are people, process, and data. Right? So on the people side, you're starting to see collaboration environments uh, with sharing where people can invite others and where you have um, shared resources, shared data, et cetera. Uh, everything brought into that one workspace. On the processes side, you're starting to see an attached compute with environment management. So you're starting to see um, uh, managed Spark, managed deployment, everything around the machinery just being ready to go and attached to your tools and your data. And then, of course, on the data side, you're starting to see a layer emerge that helps you manage your data in a common way, whether it's indexing it, finding it, or accessing it in a common way with the proper permissions. So this is what we're starting to see in terms of like the, the not the canonical, but a very common pattern in industry for data science platforms to meet the needs previously mentioned. And many of these are actually built on a core, on a core stack of open source. Right? So on the client side, you see Jupyter, you have RStudio, you have the languages, of course, like Python R, you have the frameworks like Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, TensorFlow. On the big data side, you often see Spark. You will still will see some Hadoop, but mostly as a legacy environment. Then on the storage side, you see object storage, you see Parquet, and Avro files. So this is now where executives start looking at it and start saying, like, well, if it's all available, why can't we just download it and start using it? And of course, the answer is you need everything else around it. What we tell people is that open source, especially something like Spark, is really an engine, right? And just like if someone came and dropped this engine on your front door, you can't take that and go down to the corner store and get milk with it, right? You still need the wheels, you need the body, you need the fenders, you need the windshield, you need everything else around it. So it's all those things around it that you put together that actually create the framework for you, to create the platform that actually meets those enterprise needs. The things are hosting, security, things like version currency, keeping up to date on that, connectivity to data sources, as well as scalability, right? Connectivity to the, the back ends. So that's the, the first part in terms of what role uh, Spark plays. Foundational, uh, critical, um, necessary, but not sufficient. So in terms of the second role, what we've seen, I mean, you guys are all familiar with this, right? You've seen just Python and R just really take off. Um, to a lesser extent, you'll see the same thing with the commercial side with SPSS and SAS. Overall, it's a multipolar world out there for data science. I have yet to see any single customer, and we've talked to many, many of them, who is a single tool shop, right? Especially with the new data scientists coming on board. Those guys are all, you know, R, Python, et cetera. So every, every shop has a multitude of tools that work together. Um, the one challenge here, though, is that some of these older tools, like R and Python, they're designed, they're programming languages, they're designed to be sequential, right? And this is actually where we start, we're starting to see now people marry the two, start marrying Spark with Python, with R. Actually, that was a part of the conversation from us uh, sat in on the previous session. That was actually part of their, their comment as well. So what we're seeing is that we're seeing people develop first in R and Python, get up, up and running quickly, but then they'll start hitting limits, right? They'll start hitting limits in terms of the time window they have to process it on a nightly basis, in terms of how much data can actually be uh, ingested here. And then based on those limits, we, we're seeing them turn to Spark and uh, marry the two. And what that looks like is you have the top, which is the original path, you have the data on the left, you have an R process, and then you have an output, right? Pretty standard. What you're starting to see, what it's moving to now, is you have data, you still have an R script, but parts of the R script that can be parallelized, or where the heavy data management is, are now getting pushed out to a Spark cluster. I'll walk you guys through an example we did for a customer. Um, we actually have this as a, as a blog post, so it'll be published today. So you guys can go on there and check it out and look at the sample notebook. Um, the way they, this is a large retailer, hundreds of stores, um, millions of customers. They have, they segment their customer base. They have several hundred segments. For each segment, they actually want to create a, or create or update a model, a model, a behavioral model, right? So is this person likely to come back? Is this person likely to buy things? And they do that 
essentially in a giant for loop in R. So in that giant for loop, they have, the first thing they do is they, they query the transactional data, uh, one query for every segment, one at a time, extract the data, pre-process it, and then create a model from that, and then save that model data somewhere. That took 90 minutes. 90 minutes by itself is not a massive time, a massive amount of time. But it does interrupt the flow when you're testing and iterating with, uh, with the different techniques, right? The other thing it was doing for these guys in particular was that they only had a certain window at, on a nightly batch to actually execute all this different analysis. So that 90 minutes was really eating into that window. So they actually were running it just uh, once a month or so to avoid hitting the, the time limit. What we did instead was we actually made it parallel using, using uh, Spark, Spark R. First thing um, we did was read the, read the whole, all the data at once. So instead of doing you know, one query per segment, read all the data. Um, we pre-processed the whole thing at once, standard transforms, nothing, nothing special. Um, it's very simple, uh, very simple cleanup type work. Um, and then we actually took the part that did the model that was in the for loop, and we took that and put it into a package it up as a function. And then by packaging it up as a function, we then were able to push that out to the Spark cluster and have Spark handle in parallel all the different modeling aspects of it. So much simpler code, uh, much more scalable, more importantly, it actually delegated the parallel processing to Spark where it belongs versus being within the R script. And now what we see with this one is a 15 minute execution window. So because it's 15 minutes, they can execute, this becomes a really rapid iteration for them in terms of testing and development. It also becomes something that they can run on a much more uh, frequent basis. So I think they run about once a week or so. So you just get a lot of good things from doing this. Second example, it's a little bit more relevant broadly. So APIs, um, so APIs are mostly designed to, to have one single item, to respond to one single item. So think of uh, address lookup, right? The API generally is give me one address and I'll give you one response. Well, what if you have a thousand addresses or a million addresses? Well, APIs aren't really designed to take a bulk uh, item and then give you a bulk response. They're designed to be called multiple times. Can I leave it up to you to figure out how to do that? What that means, though, is in practice, if you do it like using R or uh, Python, it becomes sequential. So if you have 1,000 addresses, you have 1,000 calls to the API. So your time is the number of records times the API time. What we actually built, and we'll release this as open source and just a simple library, is we built a wrapper that lets you uh, define an API input and output and then delegate that to Spark and have the Spark workers, each one go off and do the API. So it takes any generic API, hand it off to Spark, and let them do the work of parallelizing it and give you the response back. So under that structure, you define the structure, the input output. Uh, you get the list that you need to process, the so list of all the addresses. Package that up, hand it off to a library that, that we've written. All that does behind the scenes is really call Spark and hand off to Spark so that all the Spark workers can go and execute that for you. Of course, on this one, the processing time is really dependent on the number of workers, right? The more workers you have, the more you cut your processing time. Um, so it's actually a lot flatter in terms of how that time grows. So this is really interesting. We've actually had several customers ask us for this, and we're expecting to see huge uh, increases in output based on this. We have this as a sample notebook, so it's in the slides, but you can look for something called uh, extracting semantic roles from blogs using Watson natural language. So just another example of how Spark is really acting as that parallel extensible layer for standard R and Python things. So where are we taking it from here? So a year and a half ago, we made a pretty massive commitment to Spark. Um, several thousand employees working on all throughout the company in terms of products, core technology, and we're starting to see the results of that. So what we see is our contributions really are popping more in the area of machine learning, um, more in the area of making it enterprise ready, such as with SQL, as well as what I was talking about in terms of connecting and binding together all these different tools. So we're also, we're also heavily focused on PySpark as well as Spark R. So along that, those lines of binding things together, uh, we're actually releasing a new 
a new open source product, not product, open source tool. It's called Jupyter Enterprise Gateway. So what we do with this is we let you connect a Jupyter notebook to a Spark cluster. Uh, we, we did some, a version of this before. It was called Apache Tor. It was just a top level project. This version now takes it a step further and makes it enterprise ready. The biggest difference here is that you now preserve identity throughout the cluster. So before it was just a pool of compute anonymous. You threw a job at it, gave it back, but you had no visibility in terms of who did what. Now you actually can go out it and trace all the way throughout the processing as well. So if you guys are interested in, in building up your own uh, data science platform by assembling all these different tools, highly urge you to look at Jupyter Enterprise Gateway as a way to connect um, your front end clients to your back end Spark cluster. Of course, shameless plug, we've done that work for you. So if you guys are interested, uh, check out the IBM Data Science Experience. It's a platform for data scientists, it brings together everything they need in one place to make them productive and ready to go. We have a free trial. Uh, we also have desktop versions and local versions. So that's all I had. Short and sweet. Any questions? I left you speechless. Any questions? No? Uh, well, that concludes the session for today. Thank you for coming. Thank you, guys. <laughs>